Chapter Thirty One of the Tenant of Wildfell Hall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte. Chapter Thirty One. March twentieth, eighteen twenty four. The dreaded time is come, and Arthur is gone, as I expected. This time he announced it his intention to make but a short stay in London, and pass over to the Continent, where he should probably stay a few weeks. But I shall not expect him till after the lapse of many weeks. I know now that, with him, days signify weeks, and weeks months. July 30th. He returned about three weeks ago, rather better in health, certainly, than before, but still worse in temper. And yet perhaps I am wrong. It is I that am less patient and forbearing. I am tired out with his injustice, his selfishness, and hopeless depravity. I wish a milder word would do. I am no angel, and my corruption rises against it. My poor father died last week. Arthur was vexed to hear of it, because he saw that I was shocked and grieved, and he feared the circumstance would mar his comfort. When I spoke of ordering my mourning, he exclaimed, Oh, I hate black, but however, I suppose you must wear it a while, for form's sake. But I hope, Helen, you won't think it your bad and duty to compose your face and manners into conformity with your funereal garb. Why should you sigh and groan, and I be made uncomfortable, because an old gentleman in Shire, a perfect stranger to us both, has thought proper to drink himself to death? There, now, I declare you're crying. Why, it must be affectation. He would not hear of my attending the funeral, or going for a day or two to cheer poor Frederick's solitude. It was quite unnecessary, he said, and I was unreasonable to wish it. What was my father to me? I had never seen him but once since I was a baby, and I well knew he never cared a stiver about me, and my brother, too, was little better than a stranger. Besides, dear Helen, said he, embracing me with flattering fondness, I cannot spare you for a single day. Then how have you managed without me these many days? said I. Ah, then I was knocking about the world. Now I am at home, and home without you, my household deity, would be intolerable. Yes, as long as I am necessary to your comfort— but you did not say so before, when you urged me to leave you, in order that you might get away from your home without me, retorted I. But before the words were well out of my mouth, I regretted having uttered them. It seemed so heavy a charge, if false, too gross an insult, if true, too humiliating a fact to be thus openly cast in his teeth. But I might have spared myself that momentary pang of self-reproach. The accusation awoke neither shame nor indignation in him. He attempted neither denial nor excuse but only answered with a long, low, chuckling laugh, as if he viewed the whole transaction as a clever, merry jest from beginning to end. Surely that man will make me dislike him at last. Sign as you brew, my fair maiden, keep mind that ye maun drink the yill. Yes, and I drink it to the very dregs, and none but myself shall know how bitter I find it. August 20th. We are shaken down again to our usual position— Arthur has returned to nearly his former condition and habits, and I have found it my wisest plan to shut my eyes against the past and future, as far as he at least is concerned, and live only for the present, to love him when I can, to smile, if possible, when he smiles, be cheerful when he is cheerful, and pleased when he is agreeable, and when he is not, to try to make him so, and if that won't answer, to bear with him, to excuse him, and forgive him as well as I can and restrain my own evil passions from aggravating his, and yet, while I thus yield and minister to his more harmless propensities to self-indulgence, to do all in my power to save him from the worse. But we shall not be long alone together. I shall shortly be called upon to entertain the same select body of friends as we had the autumn before last, with the addition of Mr. Hattersley, and, at my special request, his wife and child. I long to see Millicent, and her little girl, too. The latter is now above a year old, she will be a charming playmate for my little Arthur. September 30th. Our guests have been here a week or two, but I have had no leisure to pass any comments upon them till now. I cannot get over my dislike to Lady Lowborough. It is not founded on mere personal pique. It is the woman herself that I dislike, because I so thoroughly disapprove of her. I always avoid her company as much as I can without violating the laws of hospitality, but when we do speak or converse together, it is with the utmost civility, even apparent cordiality on her part. But preserve me from such cordiality. It is like handling briar-roses and may-blossoms, bright enough to the eye, and outwardly soft to the touch, but you know there are thorns beneath, and every now and then you feel them, too, 
and perhaps resent the injury by crushing them in till you have destroyed their power, though somewhat to the detriment of your own fingers. Of late, however, I have seen nothing in her conduct towards Arthur to anger or alarm me. During the first few days I thought she seemed very solicitous to win his admiration. Her efforts were not unnoticed by him. I frequently saw him smiling to himself at her artful maneuvers. But, to his praise be it spoken, her shafts fell powerless by his side. Her most bewitching smiles, her haughtiest frowns, were ever received with the same immutable, careless good humor, till finding he was indeed impenetrable, she suddenly remitted her efforts, and became, to all appearance, as perfectly indifferent as himself. Nor have I since witnessed any symptom of pique on his part, or renewed attempts at conquest upon hers. This is as it should be, but Arthur never will let me be satisfied with him. I have never, for a single hour since I married him, known what it is to realize that sweet idea. In quietness and confidence shall be your rest. Those two detestable men, Grimsby and Hattersley, have destroyed all my labor against his love of wine. They encourage him daily to overstep the bounds of moderation, and not unfrequently to disgrace himself by positive excess. I shall not soon forget the second night after their arrival. Just as I had retired from the dining-room with the ladies, before the door was closed upon us, Arthur exclaimed, "'Now then, my lads, what say you to a regular jollification?' Millicent glanced at me with a half-reproachful look, as if I could hinder it, but her countenance changed when she heard Hattersley's voice shouting through door and wall, "'I'm your man. Send for more wine. Here isn't half enough.' We had scarcely entered the drawing-room before we were joined by Lord Lowborough. "'What can induce you to come so soon?' exclaimed his lady, with a most ungracious air of dissatisfaction. "'You know I never drink, Annabella,' replied he seriously. "'Well, but you might stay with them a little. It looks so silly to always be dangling after the women. I wonder you can.' He reproached her with a look of mingled bitterness and surprise, and sinking into a chair suppressed a heavy sigh, bit his pale lips, and fixed his eyes upon the floor. "'You did right to leave them, Lord Lowborough,' said I. I trust you will always continue to honor us so early with your company, and if Annabella knew the value of true wisdom and the misery of folly and an intemperance, she would not talk such nonsense even in jest. He raised his eyes while I spoke, and gravely turned them upon me, with a half-surprised, half-abstracted look, and then bent them on his wife. "'At least,' said she, "'I know the value of a warm heart and a bold manly spirit.' "'Well, Annabella,' said he, in a deep and hollow tone, since my presence is disagreeable to you, I will relieve you of it. Are you going back to them, then? said she carelessly. No, exclaimed he, with harsh and startling emphasis. I will not go back to them. I will never stay with them one moment longer than I think right, for you or any other tempter. But you needn't mind. I shall never trouble you again by intruding my company upon you so unseasonably. He left the room. I heard the hall door open and shut, and immediately after, on putting aside the curtain, I saw him pacing down the park, in the comfortless gloom of the damp, cloudy twilight. "'It would serve you right, Annabella,' said I at length, "'if Lord Lorborough were to return to his old habits, which had so nearly effected his ruin, and which it cost him such an effort to break. You would then see cause to repent such conduct as this.' "'Not at all, my dear. I should not mind if his lordship were to see fit to intoxicate himself every day. I should only the sooner be rid of him.' "'Oh, Annabella!' cried Millicent. "'How can you say such wicked things?' It would indeed be a just punishment, as far as you are concerned, if Providence should take you at your word, and make you feel what others feel, that—' She paused as a sudden burst of loud talking and laughter reached us from the dining-room, in which the voice of Hattersley was preeminently conspicuous, even to my unpractised ear. "'What you feel at this moment, I suppose,' said Lady Lowborough, with a malicious smile, fixing her eyes upon her cousin's distressed countenance. The latter offered no reply, but averted her face and brushed away a tear. At that moment the door opened, and admitted Mr. Hargrave, just a little flushed, his dark eyes sparkling with unwanted vivacity. "'Oh, I'm so glad you've come, Walter,' cried his sister. "'But I wish you could have got Ralph to come, too.' "'Utterly impossible, dear Millicent,' replied he gaily. "'I had much ado to get away myself. Ralph attempted to keep me by violence. Huntington threatened me with the eternal loss of his friendship, and Grimsby, worse than all, endeavoured to make me ashamed of my virtue, by such galling sarcasms and innuendos as he knew would wound me the most. So you see, ladies, you ought to make me welcome when I have braved and suffered so much for the favour of your sweet society. He smilingly turned to me, and bowed as he finished the sentence. Isn't he handsome now, Helen? whispered Millicent, her sisterly pride overcoming for the moment all other considerations. 
"'He would be,' I returned, "'if that brilliance of eye and lip and cheek were natural to him. "'But look again a few hours hence.' "'Here the gentleman took a seat near me at the table "'and petitioned for a cup of coffee. "'I consider this an apt illustration of heaven taken by storm,' said he, "'as I handed one to him. "'I am in paradise now, but I have fought my way through flood and fire to win it. "'Ralph Hattersley's last resource was to set his back against the door "'and swear I would find no passage but through his body.' a pretty substantial one, too. Happily, however, that was not the only door, and I effected my escape by the side entrance through the butler's pantry, to the infinite amazement of Benson, who was cleaning the plate. Mr. Hargrave laughed, and so did his cousin, but his sister and I remained silent and grave. "'Pardon my levity, Mrs. Huntington,' murmured he, more seriously, as he raised his eyes to my face. "'You are not used to these things. You suffer them to affect your delicate mind too sensibly.' "'But I thought of you in the midst of those lawless roisterers, "'and I endeavoured to persuade Mr. Hunterdon to think of you too, but to no purpose. "'I fear he is fully determined to enjoy himself this night, "'and it will be no use keeping the coffee waiting for him or his companions. "'It will be much if they join us at tea. "'Meanwhile, I earnestly wish I could banish the thoughts of them from your mind, "'and my own, too, for I hate to think of them, "'yes, even of my dear friend Huntington, "'when I consider the power he possesses "'over the happiness of one so immeasurably superior to himself.' and the use he makes of it. I positively detest the man. "'You had better not say so to me, then,' said I. "'Bad as he is, he is part of myself, and you cannot abuse him without offending me. Pardon me, then, for I would sooner die than offend you. But let us say no more of him for the present, if you please.' At last they came, but not till after ten, when tea, which had been delayed for more than half an hour, was nearly over. Much as I had longed for their coming, my heart failed me at the riotous uproar of their approach, and Millicent turned pale, and almost started from her seat, as Mr. Hattersley burst into the room with a clamorous volley of oaths in his mouth, which Hargrave endeavoured to check by entreating him to remember the ladies. "'Ah, you do well to remind me of the ladies, you dastardly deserter,' cried he, shaking his formidable fist at his brother-in-law. "'If it were not for them, you well know I'd demolish you in the twinkling of an eye.' and give your body to the fowls of heaven and the lilies of the fields. Then planting a chair by Lady Lowborough's side, he stationed himself in it, and began to talk to her with a mixture of absurdity and impudence that seemed rather to amuse than to offend her, though she affected to resent his insolence, and to keep him at bay with sallies of smart and spirited repartee. Meanwhile Mr. Grimsby seated himself by me, in the chair vacated by Hargrave as they entered, and gravely stated that he would thank me for a cup of tea and Arthur placed himself beside poor Millicent, confidentially pushing his head into her face, and drawing in closer to her as she shrank away from him. He was not so noisy as Hattersley, but his face was exceedingly flushed. He laughed incessantly, and while I blushed for all I saw and heard of him, I was glad that he chose to talk to his companion in so low a tone that no one could hear what he said but herself. "'What fools they are!' drawled Mr. Grimsby, who had been talking away at my elbow, with sententious gravity all the time but I had been too much absorbed in contemplating the deplorable state of the other two, especially Arthur, to attend to him. "'Did you ever hear such nonsense as they talk, Mrs. Huntington?' he continued. "'I'm quite ashamed of them, for my part. They can't take so much as a bottle between them, without getting it into their heads.' "'You are pouring the cream into your saucer, Mr. Grimsby.' "'Ah, yes, I see. But we're almost in darkness here. Hargrave, snuff those candles, will you?' "'They're wax. They don't require snuffing,' said I. The light of the body is in the eye, observed Hargrave, with a sarcastic smile. If thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Grimsby repulsed him with a solemn wave of the hand, and then, turning to me, continued, with the same drawling tones and strange uncertainty of utterance and heavy gravity of aspect as before. But as I was saying, Mrs. Huntington, they have no head at all. They can take half a bottle of wine without being affected some way, whereas I, well— I've taken three times as much as they have to-night, and you see I'm perfectly steady. Now that may strike you as very singular, but I think I can explain it. You see, their brains—I mention no names, but you'll understand to whom I allude—their brains are light to begin with, and the fumes of the fermented liquor render them lighter still, and produce an entire light-headedness or giddiness, resulting in intoxication, whereas my brains, being composed of more solid materials— will absorb a considerable quantity of this alcoholic vapour, without the production of any sensible result. "'I think you will find a sensible result produced on that tea,' interrupted Mr. Hargrave, "'by the quantity of sugar you have put into it. Instead of your usual complement of one lump, you have put in six. 
"'Have I so?' replied the philosopher, diving with his spoon into the cup, and bringing up several half-dissolved pieces in confirmation of the assertion. "'Hm! I perceive. Thus, madam, you see the evil of absence of mind, of thinking too much while engaged in the common concerns of life. Now, if I had my wits about me, like ordinary men, instead of within me, like the philosopher, I should not have spoilt this cup of tea, and been constrained to trouble you for another.' "'That is the sugar-basin, Mr. Grimsby. Now you have spoiled the sugar, too, and I'll thank you to ring for some more, for here is Lord Lowborough at last, and I hope his lordship will condescend to sit down with us, such as we are, and allow me to give him some tea.' His lordship gravely bowed in answer to my appeal, but said nothing. Meantime Hargrave volunteered to ring for the sugar, while Grimsby lamented his mistake, and attempted to prove that it was owing to the shadow of the urn and the badness of the lights. Lord Lowborough had entered a minute or two before, unobserved by any one but me, and had been standing before the door, grimly surveying the company. He now stepped up to Annabella, who sat with her back towards him, with Hattersley still beside her, though now not attending to her, being occupied in vociferously abusing and bullying his host. "'Well, Annabella,' said her husband, as he leant over the back of her chair, "'which of these three bold, manly spirits would you have me to resemble?' "'By heaven and earth you shall resemble us all!' cried Hattersley, starting up and rudely seizing him by the arm. "'Hallo, Huntington!' he shouted. "'I've got him! Come, man, and help me! And damn me if I don't make him drunk before I let him go! He shall make up for all past delinquencies as sure as I'm a living soul!' There followed a disgraceful contest, Lord Lowborough in desperate earnest and pale with anger, silently struggling to release himself from the powerful madman that was striving to drag him from the room. I attempted to urge Arthur to interfere in behalf of his outraged guest, but he could do nothing but laugh. "'Huntington, you fool! Come and help me, can't you?' cried Hattersley, himself somewhat weakened by his excesses. "'I'm wishing you Godspeed, Hattersley,' cried Arthur, "'and aiding you with my prayers. I can't do anything else if my life depended on it. I'm quite used up. Oh, oh!' And leaning back in his seat, he clapped his hands on his sides and groaned aloud. "'Annabella, give me a candle,' said Lowborough, whose antagonist had now got him around the waist, and was endeavouring to root him from the doorpost, to which he madly clung, with all the energy of desperation. "'I shall take no part in your rude sports,' replied the lady, coldly drawing back. "'I wonder you can expect it.' But I snatched up a candle and brought it to him. He took it, and held the flame to Hattersley's hands, till, roaring like a wild beast, the latter unclasped them, and let him go. He vanished, I suppose, to his own apartment, for nothing more was seen of him till the morning. Swearing and cursing like a maniac, Hattersley threw himself on to the ottoman beside the window. The door being now free, Millicent attempted to make her escape from the scene of her husband's disgrace, but he called her back and insisted upon her coming to him. "'What do you want, Ralph?' murmured she, reluctantly approaching him. "'I want to know what is the matter with you,' said he, pulling her on to his knee like a child. "'What are you crying for, Millicent? Tell me!' "'I am not crying.' "'You are,' persisted he rudely pulling her hands from her face. "'How dare you tell such a lie!' "'I'm not crying now,' pleaded she. "'But you have been, and just this minute, too, and I will know what for. Come now, you shall tell me.' "'Do let me alone, Ralph. Remember, we are not at home.' "'No matter, you shall answer my question,' exclaimed her tormentor, and he attempted to extort the confession by shaking her, and remorselessly crushing her slight arms in the grip of his powerful fingers. "'Don't let him treat your sister in that way,' said I to Mr. Hargrave. "'Come now, Hattersley, I can't allow that,' said the gentleman, stepping up to the ill-assorted couple. "'Let my sister alone, if you please.' And he made an attempt to unclasp the ruffian's fingers from her arm, but was suddenly driven backward and nearly laid upon the floor by a violent blow on the chest, accompanied by the admonition, "'Take that for your insolence, and learn to interfere between me and mine again.' "'If you were not drunk, I'd have satisfaction for that,' gasped Hargrave, white and breathless, as much from passion as from the immediate effects of the blow. "'Go to the devil,' responded his brother-in-law. "'Now, Millicent, tell me what you are crying for.' "'I'll tell you some other time,' murmured she, when we are alone. "'Tell me now,' said he, with another shake and a squeeze that made her draw in her breath and bite her lip, to suppress a cry of pain. "'I'll tell you, Mr. Hattersley,' said I. "'She was crying from pure shame and humiliation for you, because she could not bear to see you conduct yourself so disgracefully.' "'Confound you, madam,' muttered he with a stare of stupid amazement at my impudence. "'It was not that. Was it, Millicent?' She was silent. "'Come, speak up, child.' "'I can tell now,' sobbed she. 
"'But you can say yes or no, as well as I can't tell. Come.' "'Yes,' she whispered, hanging her head and blushing at the awful acknowledgment. "'Curse you for an impertinent hussy, then!' cried he, throwing her from him with such violence that she fell on her side. But she was up again before either I or her brother could come to her assistance, and made the best of her way out of the room, and, I suppose, upstairs without loss of time. The next object of assault was Arthur, who sat opposite, and had, no doubt, richly enjoyed the whole scene. "'Now, Huntington,' exclaimed his irascible friend, "'I will not have you sitting there and laughing like an idiot. "'Oh, Hattersley,' cried he, wiping his swimming eyes, "'you'll be the death of me. "'Yes, I will, but not as you suppose. "'I'll have the heart out of your body, man, "'if you irritate me with any more of that imbecile laughter. "'What, are you at it yet? "'There, see if that'll settle you,' cried Hattersley, "'snatching up a footstool and hurling it at the head of his host. "'But he as well as missed his aim, "'and the latter still sat collapsed and quaking with feeble laughter, "'with tears running down his face.' a deplorable spectacle indeed. Hattersley tried cursing and swearing, but it would not do. He then took a number of books from the table beside him, and threw them one by one at the object of his wrath, but Arthur only laughed the more, and finally Hattersley rushed upon him in a frenzy, and seizing him by the shoulders gave him a violent shaking, under which he laughed and shrieked alarmingly. But I saw no more. I thought I had witnessed enough of my husband's degradation, and leaving Annabella and the rest to follow when they pleased, I withdrew but not to bed. Dismissing Rachel to her rest, I walked up and down my room in an agony of misery for what had been done, and suspense, not knowing what might further happen, or how or when that unhappy creature would come up to bed. At last he came, slowly and stumblingly ascending the stairs, supported by Grimsby and Hattersley, who neither of them walked quite steadily themselves, but were both laughing and joking at him, and making noise enough for all the servants to hear. He himself was no longer laughing now, but sick and stupid. I will write no more about that. Such disgraceful scenes, or nearly such, have been repeated more than once. I don't say much to Arthur about it, for, if I did, it would do more harm than good, but I let him know that I intensely dislike such exhibitions, and each time he has promised they should never again be repeated. But I fear he is losing the little self-command and self-respect he once possessed. Formerly he would have been ashamed to act thus at least before any other witnesses than his boon companions, or such as they. His friend Hargrave, with a prudence and self-government that I envy for him, never disgraces himself by taking more than sufficient to render him a little elevated, and is always the first to leave the table after Lord Lowborough, who, wiser still, perseveres in vacating the dining-room immediately after us. But never once, since Annabella offended him so deeply, has he entered the drawing-room before the rest, always spending the interim in the library, which I take care to have lighted for his accommodation, or on fine moonlit nights in roaming about the grounds. But I think she regrets her misconduct, for she has never repeated it since, and of late she has comported herself with wonderful propriety towards him, treating him with more uniform kindness and consideration than ever I have observed her to do before. I date the time of this improvement from the period when she ceased to hope and strive for Arthur's admiration. End of chapter 31